So whoever you are and wherever you may be on your own personal life spiritual journey, you are welcome here at the Sunderland Congregational Church, a part of the United Church of Christ. And so I'm sure you've all heard the news that last night um, Iran sent, I think, 200 or maybe a little bit more uh, drones and missiles against Israel because Israel attacked some of their military personnel in Damascus. And um, Iran said, you know, this is the end um, as far as we're concerned. But Israel said, they're not sure this is the end. And the whole world is kind of on a little bit of pins and needles wondering where this will take us. And it's almost like we can see that this is leading to a not good place, that this is going to re lead to a regional war and maybe more. And we can see it. I don't think anybody really wants to go there. But we don't have a way to stop it, it seems. It seems like it takes on a life of its own. And sometimes our, our baser selves, they just don't listen to our more altruistic selves. And so when we come to church in a world that is so in love with violence that would sooner turn to a gun than to a diplomat, we need to have these sanctuaries where we can breathe and just realize that even if it's not the way the world is run, it's the way we can run. And so when we're going to read today's gospel, we're going to hear Jesus promise, the resurrected Jesus promise, peace be with you. And that is a prayer that sometimes when we don't know how to get there, when we can see ourselves barreling towards where we don't want to go, but we don't know how to stop it, that's when we have to turn to God and ask God, peace be with you, because we don't know how to do it. And so as we are gathered today for our worship, May that be one of our prayers that we kind of sneak in here and there. Uh, because when we say them together, I think that, you know, God takes notice. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. May we offer up our prayers of peace be with you. So let's try to keep that in mind throughout this service. I don't know what's going on in the news right now, um, but I hope it's not worse. I, I hope there's some possible way um, that these nations in the Middle East can, can find a way to live together that we on this earth can find a way to live together. And so with all of that said, that heavy load, 
uh, we are still an Easter people. We are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and the promise of our own. So in that joyous, hope-filled message, I ask you to please stand if you are able for our opening hymn and candle lighting, Jesus Christ has risen today, read hymnal number 187. <laughs> turn to our bulletins for the call to worship. Our faith in the risen Jesus sets us apart, not for privilege or preference, but for the blessing of witnessing to the truth. Beloved, we are God's children now. What will be has not yet been revealed, but we hope to live like Christ. The risen Savior empowers our ministries and strengthens our faith as he greets us with the words, Peace be with you. We trust in that promise of peace and look forward to what Christ will make possible as we live into our faith. And now coming together is this congregation in person, also those joining us via Zoom and later through FCAT, our unison prayer. God of our ancestors, author of all creation and life, Source of Easter hope, we are drawn together again by the mystery of life, death, and life restored. We call on you, the one so far beyond our knowing, with a mixture of faith and experience. We sense your presence in our lives, but it is larger than we can explain. This is why we relish these special moments at worship when we trust ourselves to your surrounding love. Draw together the fragments of our busy lives. Restore the wholeness that you intended at creation so that we may become a godly people. Help us to live at our best. Grant us a fuller sense of what is right and holy. Resurrect us when our lives close and also by raising us up now to live in imitation of Jesus Christ. Amen.
is from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. And i got to go back a little bit because when I read the first sentence, I had no idea what they were talking about. Peter had just, with, in the name of Jesus Christ, healed a crippled man who couldn't walk. And so this is what they are talking about. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us, though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murder given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him his perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In the way God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Okay. Hello there. Second time up here already. All right. So we heard um, already one word. We're going to hear it again in the gospel. It's a pretty big word. It's witnesses. And I know that means a lot to you, witnesses. So a witness is somebody who has seen something and or heard something and wants to tell somebody else about it. And sometimes a witness is something, you're, you're a witness to something that somebody else hasn't seen. So this past week we had like a day and a half of sun. It was, and so I got to go outside and I was doing some raking. And outside in my yard while I was raking, I know that there used to be poison ivy. And so last year I sprayed it. I thought I killed it. I'm out there raking and looking around. I don't see the poison ivy. I thought I was all safe. And then lo and behold, I've got poison ivy on me. Yuck. Oh. And so that you've never had poison ivy? You never had poison ivy? I have. Oh, you have. Oh. Yeah, poison ivy is just like a, like a really bad mosquito bite. And you gotta just, but you can't scratch it. And so I didn't see it, but the son of a gun stuff, it was there. And so when you're a witness, you have to, you're supposed to see things that maybe somebody else didn't see, and you tell them what you saw that they didn't see. And so today in the first reading that Irene just read, in the, in the reading we're going to have in the gospel, that word witnesses comes because Jesus was around like 2,000 years ago. That's a long, long time ago. And so he can't, I can't see Jesus, but I can trust the witness of other people who did. And so witness is that we are supposed to testify to things that other people may not see. And so that's what we're called upon to do in Sunday school and in church and in everyday life. Well, there, you're witnessing to something over there. What are you seeing that I'm not seeing? Huh? Is it the plant? Do you like the plant? Uh, oh, it's grandma. Okay. All right. All right. So witnessing is seeing things that others don't see and trying to share it with them. Okay. So have a wonderful Sunday school. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Take care. Okay. You jumped. Okay. Okay. And today we are treated to our bell choir and their anthem is praying at the river.
Every time I hear that, I think of that movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, I think it's called. Yeah, that's a good thing. I like that. All right, it is now time for us to share in our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And I need help out there. We have uh, five people that are going to this afternoon's Ecclesiastical Council, Susan and Sue and Irene and Cheryl and myself. I forgot the woman's name. Pain something? Yes, Judith Payne. Judith Payne. Um, and so she really is extremely qualified. Her, her uh, ordination paper was very interesting. And so I would ask that we keep her in our prayers this afternoon as she goes to her ecclesiastical council. If it all goes well with the ecclesiastical council, she's then free to uh, circulate her, um, her, her, uh, uh, her, her call for a, a, a parish, a church. And so if she gets that, she can then be ordained. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing her talk some more. Uh, this young woman had graduated from, let's see, uh, Chicago Theological Seminary with a 4.125 average, grade point average. I don't know how you get a 4.125 grade point average. And she also won a preaching award at a school filled with future preachers. And so this, this, uh, this person is really going to be an exceptional uh, pastor someday, and I'm glad to be a part of uh, watching her uh, grow into that. So please keep her in your prayers this afternoon at 3 o'clock. And I'm very grateful that we have five of us from our church that will be going to the Franklin Association gathering because that is really part of our covenant to support one another. So that'll be this afternoon. Also, prayers are offered for Ukraine. Um, with spring coming, that war is ramping up. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the service, also prayers for that, that conflict between Israel and Hamas that has now spread to include Iran. And we pray that it doesn't grow any further, but I'm afraid that it may. Uh, so we pray for peace there and in our world. Uh, we continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And I'd like to offer prayers for friends of mine, Richard and Joseph, uh, that they may know uh, full recoveries. Are there any prayers, joys, celebrations, concerns from anyone? Yes, Cheryl. Um, I'd like to just give an update on my niece, Antonia, who's been on the prayer list for cancer for about a year. Um, the cancer has stopped, but it's still going on. She has All right, Cheryl, we will. Yeah, Carol? Marsha's not here, but she wanted me to thank everybody for praying for that R, I, whatever, IRB. He's the pastor for the Marine Corps, and he passed away last week. Oh, he passed away? Oh, okay. All right, so Irv is on uh, the list here, and uh, he's now passed away. Okay. Any other joy celebrations concerns from anyone? Okay, seeing none and none at home as well, right? Okay, let us turn to our yellow sheet then. Let us offer prayers for Alan, Alice, Amy and Tom, Antonia and family, Angie, Art, Bill, Bill, Bonnie, Brenda, Chris and family, Cheryl, Cindy, Edna, Frank, Grayson, Irv, Jeff, Jim, John, John, Kathy, Leslie, Lindy, Liz, Lynn, Marcia, Mary Jane and Joe, Mary Lou, Michelle, Mike, Pauline, Sandra, Sandra and John, Steve, Stephen, Thelma, Virginia and Richard, Wink, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, and we pray for peace on earth. And may we now turn inward for just a few moments of silence in the middle of our public worship uh, to offer God those prayers that maybe we don't know how to put into words or we just choose not to. So just a few moments of silence. God of amazing surprises, whose proclamation of peace through the risen Jesus 
is there to help us and to startle us, yet washes over us with a refreshing joy in this war-torn world, we are eager to see Jesus in order to trust that the purity of life we know through him, that it is worth emulating, that there is a chance of success if we just believe and act out as Jesus would have us do. Put us in touch with the truth that cleanses and makes whole so that we may relate to others in ways that reconcile and redeem. We ask as well that you listen to all of the prayers that we offer to you, whether said out loud or silently, and that you answer them as only you are able. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now share in the prayer that Jesus gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With gladness in our hearts, we offer our best to God. We give because God has given so much to us already. We give so that we may have a place here to worship and so that others may also hear again the news of Jesus' victory of life over death and be able to share with us in the hope and the promise that is our faith. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and also as our conditions in life allow. And we will accept your donations now here in person. And if you are uh, joining us not here in person, you are more than welcome to send in anything you'd like. However you give, if you choose to give, it is appreciated. Accept, O Lord, these offerings now to be placed here in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and all others. As Jesus will say, the resurrected Jesus will say in today's gospel, peace be with you. That is a prayer reaching down from heaven into our war-torn and violent world. Peace be with you. 
And that is one that we are supposed to witness to even after these 2,000 years. And so for all that you do, for all that you offer, so that we may be a sanctuary from this war-torn world, a place where peace is really believed in and hoped in, may we continue to be that voice of sanity in this craziness of our world. And again, that's only possible because of people like you who support this church through these donations and through your work and through your worship. So may God bless you for your continuing work as this church. May God bless and accept these offerings to his purpose and prayers and so that we may do all that we are expected to do to bring peace into this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And our reflecting hymn this morning is Thine is the Glory, read hymnal number 193. Today's gospel is taken from Luke's gospel, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. And while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. And then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, 
and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So this past Monday, as you all know, uh, was the solar eclipse. And that was one of our days where we actually had a chance to see some sun. So I also went out and I started raking in my yard, as I told the kids, and I got my poison ivy to prove it. And as I'm out there raking, I live on 63, so there's a lot of cars going back and forth. And so even though I'm outside, not really paying attention to what's going on on the road, and even though there's all these cars, I I do hear a voice of someone talking. And I hear the voice before I see the person. And the person is rather animated in their conversation. And so then I I, I take a look, and sure enough, there's a a guy walking up 63, and he's having a phone conversation. Again, pretty animated, pretty loud, so that I could hear him over the traffic. And so, now remember, I'm only hearing half of a conversation. I don't know what the other person is saying. I only hear a bit of it while he's walking from here to here. I didn't follow him to hear the rest of the story. So I only heard part of the conversation, only for a little while. So I may be way off base. But what caught my attention especially was this word on Eclipse, on Eclipse Monday was interstellar. And so, you know, our eclipse was a stellar event. It was the moon coming in front of our local star, and that's all it was. But he was talking about interstellar. And so I got kind of interested at that point, wondering where he was going to go with this interstellar talk. And sure enough, he went. (laughs) And so as he's walking along, he starts talking about the fact that this was going to be a life, world-changing event. And the impression I got is that he wasn't so impressed with the science of the moon getting in front of the sun and blocking, you know, a little path on the earth by doing so. He was imagining that in the shadow of this eclipse, there were these interstellar somethings coming into the world, and they were going to change our world. And so Monday before the eclipse at whatever, 2, 3.30, whatever it was, this guy was all excited that these interstellar something or others were going to come in the eclipse moment and you know, just like reveal themselves and change us like that. And so the science of the eclipse... We don't get another one here in North America for another 20 years, but the science of the eclipse did not really impress the guy. What he saw was beyond the science, beyond the reality, beyond that real quote-unquote ordinary, he saw this supernatural that he imagined, and the ordinary gave him free reign to let his fantasies go wild, and somehow these these people from other stars were going to come here and change our world. And so I don't know what happened after Monday's eclipse. You know, I don't know how you recover from that. I don't know what he ever, you know, called that person back the next day. I don't know what he said to that person the next day. Um, But, you know, the reality gave free reign to the fantasy. And so we are, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're just about smack dab in the middle of the Easter season. And Easter season is when we move beyond the ordinary Jesus and we start talking about the supernatural Jesus. And the supernatural Jesus is really just about unknowable to us. And so every time somebody meets the supernatural Jesus, they're bound by the ordinary and they encounter the supernatural Jesus, they don't know how to process it. Uh, The supernatural Jesus is familiar, but strange. Uh, The supernatural Jesus is recognized, but unknown. And so they just don't know what to make of the supernatural Jesus. And and I've used the example a hundred times before, that if I'm born blind and you try to explain to me red, I don't know where you would begin because I have no experience of color. So how would you begin to explain to me red? You can't say it's like that exit sign. You can't say it's like a rose in the summer. It doesn't mean anything to me because I have no experience of that. And so when Jesus is this other, this Easter Jesus, the supernatural Jesus, and he comes back into the ordinary and we're bound by the ordinary, we don't know how to convey that supernatural. It's it's just not in our language. It's not in our experience. So we don't know how to process it. So, yeah, Jesus, is that really you? I think it's you, but I'm not sure it's you. And then how in the world do you convey that to someone who hasn't even had that experience? And so we hear today that this this group of followers is gathered and they're hearing stories that other people have had 
of this other Jesus, this Easter Jesus, the supernatural Jesus. And they're, they're trying to figure out what happened. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there. And so now that experience that they were talking about with others, now it's happening to them. And when he appears, we heard today in the gospel, they were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. So there's Jesus. They say, yeah, that's Jesus, but maybe it's not Jesus. Yeah, that could be the guy that we knew before, but maybe that's not. They just don't know how to process it. They were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus has to come out and say, see that it is I myself. Look, here I am. And so where the guy walking up the road on 63 used the physical to just take these grand flights of fantasy and imagine interstellar travelers, this otherworldly Jesus, the supernatural Jesus, doesn't talk about the supernatural. He comes back to the ordinary. And we have trouble understanding because we're locked in the ordinary and he no longer is, but he points here. So it's not like the, the guy walking up the road has an ordinary and points to the supernatural. It's the supernatural pointing to how spectacular is the ordinary. And so that, I think, is an important distinction because when Jesus goes to prove himself, he doesn't go on these flights of fancy where you know, we, he could have talked about you know, what heaven is like and where the stars are and what the angels do and what God looks like and you know, kind of just hover off the ground and bounce off of walls or do some kind of Harry Potter magic. Jesus says, look, here are my hands and here are my feet. He points to his body in ordinary ways. He points out the wounds from the crucifixion here, the wounds from the crucifixion there. They stay with him. Even though he is now this other Easter Jesus, all that happened in this world stays with that Jesus. He still has the wounds on his body. And so then there's, there's still, it says in the Bible, while in their joy, so they're starting to have this seed that, oh, maybe this really is Jesus back from the dead. It goes on to say they were disbelieving and still wondering. So Jesus pointed out the crucifixion wounds on his body. He says, well, now I'll tell you what. He says, Jesus said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. This guy has been crucified. He died. He spent three days in the grave. He knows what death is. He knows what resurrection is. He comes out on Easter. He knows what heaven is like. And how does he prove it to his followers that it's really me? He has fish with them. And so the, the, important of, the importance of that isn't that he ate the fish. Because of all the wondrous stories we hear about Easter, eating a piece of fish seems the least convincing story to me that the resurrection is real. I eat a piece of broiled fish. But the point of that story is, is that Jesus ate broiled fish probably with these guys day in and day out. This was part of their routine. Jesus knew these people over the common shared meal. And so when he says, do you have anything to eat? And he shares fish with them, this otherworldly, supernatural, unbelievable Jesus of Easter, he comes back and he sets up a situation that brings them back to their ordinary when they knew Jesus who was on earth, Jesus who was the carpenter, Jesus who was the one who walked around in sandals and didn't float above the ground so that his feet got dirty, Jesus who you know, healed people, Jesus who taught people, Jesus who got all the authorities angry. This is the same Jesus because he's, look, I'm doing the same thing we did before. And I think they start to realize. So instead of taking the ordinary, like an eclipse, and imagining some supernatural fantasy, Easter doesn't tell us about heaven. Easter is Jesus coming back and pointing back to this world. You know, we've got four stories of Jesus, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And out of those four Gospels, if you add up all the chapters of those four Gospels, you come up with 84 chapters that talk about the life of Jesus. You've got five that talk about Easter. Matthew has one, Mark has one, Luke has one, John goes nuts and has two. So you got five chapters from four different Gospels about Easter. You got 84 that talk about the life of Jesus. And so what does this resurrected Jesus say when he comes back to these folks and he's sitting down having broiled fish with them? These are my words that I spoke to you. So the Easter isn't revealing something new. Okay, it's, there's no stories about heaven and streets of gold and 
you know, fancied meals or whatever else heaven may be, the resurrected Jesus comes back and he says, these are my words that I spoke to you. So it's really a vindication and a validation of everything in those 84 chapters that the earthly Jesus tried to convince us of to change this world, to live in this world. I'm sure that heaven is out there waiting. I have no idea what it's going to be. And whatever my imagination is going to be, I bet you God's idea is even better and bigger. And so I trust that it's there, but that's not in my control. That's in God's hands. But what that God who comes back from there into here, he doesn't tell us about heaven. He tells us, remember everything I said about this place. You know, imagine, you know, there's the story of the ascension. It's 40 days after Easter. So for 40 days, you've got Jesus walking and talking with these people. That means a Jesus who has died, a Jesus who has resurrected, a Jesus who has gone to heaven, a Jesus who is talking with them. Can you imagine all the questions that they would have about heaven? And do you know how many stories the resurrected Jesus tells us about heaven? Think to, your, think to yourself about the Gospels. Think about Acts of the Apostles. How many stories are there of anything that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, ever tells us about heaven? There's not a single word. So for 40 days, the resurrected Jesus is on earth talking to us. And he, te- he doesn't tell us one thing about heaven. Instead, he says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Our job is to believe in heaven. You know, that's our reward. That's where we're going to go. And that's where things will be better than this place here. But our job is to make this world better. And that's why Jesus comes into this world to make this world better. Not to wait for heaven, but to make this world better. You know, in the ordination paper that we're going to be um, privileged to to talk about this afternoon in Ecclesiastical Council, I was really impressed um, that this woman was involved in in a really tragic car accident. And as she was in this tragic car accident, sometimes when bad things happen to good people, the, the, the question could be, where is God? Instead, this woman found God in her, in her tragedy. Because when she was hurt and, and uncertain about where she was going, what, what was going to happen to her body, she is, in a certain sense, crippled still today. I, I think I heard that she had to move to Worcester because of public transportation. She couldn't live in a place like this because she has to get around uh, by public transportation. So this woman is crippled because of this accident. And she didn't blame God. She found God in that event. And she said that she sees in God a a God of disabilities, a God who still has the wounds in his hands, in his feet, in his side, in his head. They don't disappear when he's resurrected and glorified. Every time Jesus looks down, there are the the nail prints. You know, the, the world is always forever with Jesus. The pain of this world is always forever with Jesus. It, it's, it's something that he, that he doesn't forget just because he's above the clouds. So the, the supernatural Jesus is still the Jesus that was with us in our life and who understands how hard it can be down here. And he understands how violent and hate-filled it can be down here because remember what we did to him. And yet he comes back to us. How many times I've said this, when Jesus resurrects, boy, I would have shot right up to heaven. I would have said, you guys had your chance. 84 chapters worth of chances. You didn't listen to anything. I would have gone right up to heaven. But Jesus, he stays here. And he offers us the promise of resurrection. Because we are privileged to worship and to know a God of handicaps. So our God is not so far away and unknowing that he can only look down here and just say, you know, what's going on there? Jesus lived what we live. And so when Jesus comes back and he says, listen to my words, it's not about heaven. It's about changing this place. And so as we pray for peace in the world, as Jesus says, peace be with you, may that really be something that we can hope in because it's, it's not... Randy Calvo saying it. It's not even the UCC saying it. It's the resurrected Jesus who's been there coming back and saying, peace be with you. And may that power of the resurrected Jesus help us to change this world by beginning by changing us. And so may we be more Christ-like. May we witness to Jesus by the fact that we are changed by Jesus so that maybe, maybe we can change the world. Because who wants all this war? I don't know who wants the war, but we've always got the war. 
So somebody is responsible, and nobody wants it. So let us pray that peace be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. And today's hymn of closing is Fairest Lord Jesus, Red Hymnal number 227. Thank you for worshiping with us on another Easter Sunday. And please remember that uh, we, we have that Ecclesiastical Council this afternoon. Please keep um, all of us who will be gathered there from the association in your prayers as that very important uh, Holy Spirit-filled event takes place as we help this, uh, this person continue on the road towards ordination and Christian ministry. Also, immediately after our service today, um, all of the members of the church are invited to stay and to uh, participate in this discussion about this banner on peace. And um, everyone else in the church is also, even if you're not a member, is welcome to stay. You just don't have a vote, but you're more than welcome to stay uh, for that conversation. You just won't have a vote um, as we talk about this banner display out to the community um, of advocating for peace. So with that said, let us have our benediction and our congregational response as we prepare to continue the work of the church in that important meeting. So Jesus comes to us in so many ways to help us believe. He affirms who we are and he claims our faithfulness. So let us turn away from doubt and welcome the sacred possibility that is Easter's renewal. Worship helps us to be touched by mystery and wonder. We are made confident in our faith and are prepared and equipped to go out into the world to share the promise of Easter's new life. So let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that we do among all whom we may meet. Amen.